Shall we turn now in our Bibles to Leviticus chapter 26? As we begin the 26th chapter, God takes and sort of summarizes the, two, the first table of the law, man's relationship with God, and he rather summarizes them in a negative and in a positive. The negative, you shall not make idols for yourself. Interestingly enough, that word in Hebrew translated idols is literally nothings. You shall not make nothings. Of course, a double negative in English, so translated idols uh, for yourselves. Neither a carved image, which is indicative of a wooden carved image nor a sacred pillar, as uh, in the pagan religions they often had these sacred pillars. Nor shall you set up an engraved stone, that is a image that is carved out of stone, uh, to bow down to it, for I am the Lord. Now, this to bow down to it in the Hebrew is literally you're not to worship or bow down before an image even though the image you say is just representative of something else. There are people today, even within the church, who have little altars before which they bow. Expressly forbidden here in the scripture. They say, well, I'm not really bowing to this idol, you know, or I'm not really praying to the idol, but the idol just reminds me. But it is forbidden here to have images, graven images, nothings for yourself, carved image or engraved stone. Those things that would be representative of God. The interesting thing is that when a person makes an image, The reason why he makes that image is he has lost the consciousness of the presence of God. If you really live in the consciousness of the presence of God, you don't need any images or any reminders. But when a person loses that consciousness of God's presence, they want something to remind them of, of God's presence. And so they often take a relic that they make sort of a sacred shrine or a sacred relic. A reminder of God's work usually in some past experience. And there are people who make images out of a place. When I was sitting in that chair, oh, I can remember it still. Fifteen years ago, I had such a marvelous experience of God's presence. Don't touch that chair. <laughs> Don't move it, you know. It's sacred. Because there God met me. Well, that's really sort of an indictment against your present relationship with God. It is really rather sad when a person has to look back into the past to remember a time when they were near to God and God was near to them in a conscious way. And so the making of an image is an indication of a spiritual decline. The loss of the consciousness of the presence of God and yet deep within inside there's a yearning still for God. And so I make this substitute, this reminder, because down inside I still need God and I yearn for God. 
And so whenever a person begins to make little shrines or special places or memorials, it's really a testimony against their own relationship with God in the now, in the present. If your relationship with God tonight isn't richer, fuller, more blessed than it's ever been in your entire life, then you are in a backslidden state. If you have to talk about the good old days, oh, when God came down and met us, you know, and you're looking back at past experiences to relate the power of God within your life, you're backslidden. You haven't been going forward. You're not progressing. We need to be going forward in our walk and experience with the Lord so that tonight, the richest, the fullest, the most blessed experience and relationship with God I've ever known, from glory to glory, moving on into that fullness that God has for us. So maybe some of you need to repent. You've drawn away. In a positive sense, you shall keep my Sabbaths. You're not to make the idols, but you shall keep my Sabbaths, plural, because that's the holy days, Passover, the new moon Sabbath, the feast of Pentecost and the blowing of trumpets, the Yom Kippur, all of these are Sabbath days, so keep my Sabbaths, plural, and reverence my sanctuary, the tabernacle that was erected, for I am Yahweh, Jehovah. Now, God begins to give what would be described as a conditional covenant. And over and over we'll find the word if, if, if. God's promises and God's blessings are conditional. If I will meet the requirements, I will get the results. And so here are the conditions of God's blessings upon the people. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and perform them, then I will give you rain in its season. The land shall yield its produce and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Your threshing shall last till the time of vintage, and the vintage shall last till the time of sowing, and you shall eat your bread to the full and dwell in your land safely. I will give peace in the land. I will make you lie down. None will make you afraid. I will rid the land of evil beasts, and the sword will not go through your land. You will chase your enemies and they shall fall by the sword before you. Five of you shall chase a hundred. A hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight. Your enemies shall fall by the sword before you, for I will look on you favorably and make you fruitful, multiply you, and confirm my covenant with you. You shall eat the old harvest and clear out the old because of the new. I will set my tabernacle among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God, and ye shall be my people. For I am Jehovah your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, that you should not be their slaves. I have broken the bands of your yoke and made you walk upright. So these are God's promises of blessing. Now, throughout the Old Testament, we find several places where there are what we would call parallel passages to this, where God renewed his covenant with the people or where God made similar covenants with his people. In Ezekiel chapter 34, you'll find God promising much of the same things. 
as he establishes his covenant with the people. In Joel chapter 2, again, the same and similar uh, promises to those who will walk with God and keep his ways. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, as uh, we go through Deuteronomy, the second law, or the second time around uh, the law, we find in the 28th chapter, again, very parallel to this as God is promising the blessings. Basically, He will bless the land. It will bring forth abundantly. They'll have sufficient rain. Their crops will uh, last throughout the entire year. At the end of the year, they'll be getting rid of the old so they'll have room to put the new crops in. And, and they will be blessed of God. In the land, their enemies will be subdued before them, and they will walk in the joy and in the presence of God. God loves to bless his people, and God promises these blessings, but to them they were conditioned upon their walking in his statutes, keeping his commandments, and performing them. Now, as you read, on into the history, especially in the book of Judges, you will find that God kept his covenant with the people. When they would walk with God, God would subdue their enemies. And often, five would chase a hundred, and a hundred would put ten thousand to flight. They were often outnumbered by their enemies from a numeric kind of a sense, but the problem with people in figuring the things out, they didn't put into the equation God, and what a difference God makes in any equation. Like someone said, God and me is, an, is a majority, and all I need is God, and, and I can go out and be a majority against the enemies. We read in the book of Judges, Shamgar, I think he was the sixth judge, killed 600 Philistines with an ox goad. One fellow. David had a fellow in his army that in one battle, Adonai, no, what is it? It sounds like an Italian name. Uh, uh, Adonai, I think it is. Um, he killed 800 men in one battle. Uh, we remember how that Gideon, with 300 men, defeated 135,000 of the Midianites. Often they were vastly outnumbered by their enemies. And yet God put their enemies to flight before them. And over and over we read how God delivered their enemies into their hands, though they were vastly outnumbered by their enemies. And this is something that you get through the historic books of the Old Testament. First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, the book of Judges. And uh, we find that oftentimes this took place. We find that it has taken place in modern days as God has brought them back into the land so many times they have faced numeric odds superior numbers against them and yet the scripture was fulfilled and five would put a hundred to flight I think of the 1973 Yom Kippur War, the War of Atonement, where when the Syrians had broken through on the Golan Heights, had come within one mile of the Golani headquarters, the armored brigade of the Syrians, a hundred tanks plus the armored personnel carriers, the mobile cannons were just one mile from the Golani headquarters, the whole armored division of the Syrians, and the Israelis had only two tanks in their Golani headquarters. 
a young lieutenant, hearing that the Syrians had invaded, hitchhiked up to the Golani headquarters. He reported to the commanding officer, Lieutenant Greengold, Zviv, and they called him Zwiggy. And he said, I'm a tank commander. If you'll give me some tanks, we'll see what we can do against the Syrians. And they said, well, we only have two operational tanks. Wait an hour, we can get the third one running. Zwiggy helped them unload some of the bodies out of one of the tanks. They serviced it. He started out in his tank with the tank on either side, and they no sooner got around the corner from the Golani headquarters and they saw this armored brigade of the Syrian right there on the tap line route. And so Zwiggy began to fire and he began to call the commands to the tanks on either side directing their fire and nothing was happening so he popped the hatch and looked and already the other two tanks had been knocked out. So he headed over the hill in his tank and along the tap line route there are just several little hills and he was racing up and down behind those hills with his tank coming over the top popping a Syrian tank, backing down, racing up to another hill, coming over the top, popping another tank, backing down, and racing back and forth behind the hills, wiping out this Syrian armored brigade. And he kept reporting back to headquarters every time he got a tank. The Zwiggy Brigade just picked off another Syrian tank. And in 15 minutes, Zwiggy Brigade just got another Syrian tank. It's in flames, you know. And he kept making the reports back to the headquarters. They didn't know, but what Zwiggy had, a whole brigade out there. They didn't know he was operating by himself. Nor did the Syrians. And because he kept coming over different hills, they figured that the Israelis must have a whole tank brigade on the other side of the hill. And after he destroyed several tanks, 20 or so, they decided to retreat. And the whole armored brigade turned and retreated. They could have gone all the way down to Tiberias on the Sea of Galilee. The Israelis did not have any defenses. The Golani was, was totally without defenses at that point. But one <laughs> put a hundred to flight. God's promises... But, verse 14, if you do not obey me and do not observe these commandments, if you despise my statutes, or if your soul abhors my judgments, so that you do not perform all my commandments but break my covenant, then this is what I will do to you. So the blessings of keeping the covenant, the commandments, but now the tragic results of hating them, rebelling against them, failing to perform them. I will even appoint terror over you a wasting disease and fever which shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart. You will sow your seed in vain, for your enemies will eat it. We remember at the time when Gideon was called of the Lord, he was hiding in a cave threshing the wheat, because no sooner would the Israelites thresh their wheat than the Midianites would move in and take it. You will... Plant your seed in vain because your enemies are going to eat it. And I will set my face against you and you will be defeated by your enemies. And those who hate you shall reign over you and you shall flee when no one pursues you. 
And as you read the book of Judges, and tragically, and you think, my, what does it take for people to learn? As the children of Israel would repent and turn to the Lord, God would bless them, He would raise up a judge, and they would have victory over their enemies. And they would dwell for a period of time in peace and in prosperity. But then they would turn their backs on the Lord. They would forget the Lord. And the Lord would allow the enemies to come in. And they were under the oppression of the enemies. And, and then they would cry unto the Lord. The Lord would raise up a deliverer. And they would go out and they would seek the Lord. And God would defeat their enemies. And then they would be prosperous and they would forget God. And it's just a cycle over and over and over again. And you think, how is it that people can't read history and learn from history? For the scripture says, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. How is it that in the United States we can't realize that we are strong not because we are a democratic nation or not because we have a free enterprise system. We are strong because we were a nation that was dedicated to God and we had even within the whole framework our trust in God. In God we trust even minted on our coins. And it was a nation that had a God consciousness. And with that, God blessed our nation and He made our nation strong. But now we have those fools who are trying to turn our nation away from God. Who are trying to establish really the gods of humanism. Man being God. Man fulfilling his own desires. Man sovereign. And the only inevitable result and consequence will be disaster. I was interested in a report this past week from one of the major think tanks in Washington. A think tank which usually is very liberal in its um, conclusions and all. It, it's, it's one of the liberal think tanks. But they, in making a three-year study, determined that religion was extremely important for the survival of a democracy. And they were encouraging that schools be allowed at least a period of silence for meditation. And they're encouraging the tax credits. Now this is a liberal outfit that usually has in the past been totally against the church. But they've come to the realization that a faith in God is an essential for the preservation of a democracy. Democracy cannot exist without people who have some kind of a moral foundation. And this moral foundation is, you know, developed within the church and the faith in God. And so it was interesting to me that these fellows who are in the think tank business, you know, of analyzing trends and so forth, have come to this conclusion. i not a think tanker at all, but I could have told them that a long time ago. <laughs> Something I've been declaring for a long time, because I read the Bible. And it's obvious, it's right here in the Scriptures. These guys didn't have to spend several million dollars of government grant money to come up with these conclusions. All they had to do was read the Bible, and they could have found out these very same things. Government could have saved a lot of money. <laughs> Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. The strength of a nation lies in the faith of the people, that faith and trust in God. 
And so if you do not obey me, then those who hate you are going to reign over you. And after all this, if you do not obey me, then I will punish you seven times more. What it means is intensity. There will be an increased intensity, sevenfold more. God often uses national disasters to turn the hearts of the nation and of the people back to Him. God said, when my judgments are in the land, it will cause my people to turn to righteousness. God often uses national disasters to wake people up to their need for God. And, as God is saying here, if you don't hearken after this, then it's going to get worse. This is what else I'll allow to happen. I will punish you seven times more. I will break the pride of your power. I will make your heavens like iron and your earth like bronze. That is, your crops will begin to fail. The heavens will not give you rain. The ground will become hard. There will be a drought in the land. Ground will be like bronze. Your strength will be spent in vain, for your land will not yield its produce. In the earlier plague, their enemies were taking their produce. Now the land won't even yield the produce, nor shall the trees of the land yield their fruit. The next stage of God's judgment, and then, if you continue to walk contrary to me, you're not willing to obey me. I will bring on you seven times more plagues according to your sins. For I will also send wild beasts among you which shall rob you of your children. They will destroy your livestock and make you few in number. And your highways shall be desolate. And we find in the book of Judges at the time of Shamgar, the highways were empty. The people, when they wanted to go someplace, forsook the highways. They would even take back roads for fear. And if by these you are not reformed by me, but you walk contrary to me, then I also will walk contrary to you, and I will punish you yet seven times for your sins, and I will bring a sword against you, and will execute the vengeance of my covenant when you are gathered together within your cities, I will send the pestilence among you. And you will be delivered into the hand of your enemy. When I have cut off your supply of bread, ten women shall, break your bre shall bake your bread in one oven, and they shall bring back to you your bread by weight, and you shall eat and not be satisfied. Now, ten women baking their bread in one oven signifies a shortage of bread or shortage of wheat. Usually a woman had an oven for her bread. There will be so little wheat that ten women will be able to bake their bread in one oven. And then they'll bring it back to you rationing it out by weight. You'll get just a, a ration of bread. But you'll not have enough to be satisfied. You will eat, but you won't be satisfied. There will be a continued shortage of food. It's going to get worse. Now God takes it by degrees and in every case there is the opportunity to repent. There's the opportunity to turn back to God. There's that opportunity to be blessed of God again. He doesn't bring the whole hand of judgment in just one fell swoop. But He takes it little by little by little. Each time there's that chance for repentance. Each time there's that chance for turning around. But if you continue to walk away, continue to be contrary to Him, continue to go on your path, it's going to get harder 
and harder and harder and harder. And after all of this, if you do not obey me, but you walk contrary to me, then I also will walk contrary to you in fury. And I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. I, I will destroy your high places. These are the places they were told that they were not to build. I will cut down your incense altars, and I will cast your carcasses on the lifeless forms of your idols. My soul shall abhor you. Now, earlier they abhorred God, and now God is abhorring them. I will lay your cities waste and bring your sanctuaries to desolation. I will not smell the fragrance of your sweet aromas. I will bring the land to desolation, and your enemies who dwell in it shall be astonished at it. And I will scatter you among the nations and draw out a sword after you. Your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. And then the land shall enjoy its Sabbaths as long as it lies desolate and you are in your enemy's lands. Then the land shall rest and enjoy its Sabbaths. As long as it lies desolate, it shall rest. For the time it did not rest on your Sabbaths when you dwelt in it. This is really a warning of God in advance to the people of the progression of his judgments against them if they turn from him. As we follow their history, sad but true, these judgments were really a prophecy. Because exactly what God said would happen and he would do, he ultimately did. As they went into Babylonian captivity, first of all, the northern kingdom went into the captivity of the Assyrians. Their cities were laid waste. The wild beasts began to multiply in the land. And then the Babylonian army came against the southern kingdom of Judah. They destroyed the temple. They destroyed the city of Jerusalem. They took the people captive to Babylon. And for 490 years, the people had not given the land the Sabbath rest. We studied last week how that every seventh year they weren't to plant. You remember that. Let the land just grow wild. Don't even harvest it. Leave it for the poor. And if you do that in the sixth year, he'll give you enough harvest that it'll last you clear through to the ninth year. Now, they failed to keep the Sabbath when they came into the land. After a period of time, they, they got careless and they no longer gave the land the Sabbath rest. And for 490 years, they had not given the Sabbath rest to the land. So God said, all right, 490 years divided by seven means that the land has 70 years of rest coming to it. So I'll let you be in captivity in Babylon for 70 years until the land has had its Sabbath. God exacts his toll. You may not want to give it to him, but he'll take it. One way or the other, God takes his toll. And they withheld from God, holding back the Sabbath rest for the land. God said, okay, 70 years captivity in Babylon for the 70 years that the land did not have its Sabbath. Here God said that he would do that. I will scatter you among the nations. I'll draw out the sword after you. Your land will be desolate, your cities waste, and the land shall enjoy its Sabbath as long as it lies desolate and you're in your enemy's land. Jeremiah predicted the 70 years of captivity according to the 490 years that they did not give the land its Sabbath. For those that are left in the land, I'll give you faintness in their hearts. In the land of their enemies, the sound of a shaken leaf shall cause them to flee. You'll be terrified about everything. Just a leaf shaking in the tree. Ooh, what's that? And you'll run, you know. They shall flee as though they were fleeing from a sword, and they will fall when no one pursues. They shall stumble over one another as 
it were before a sword when no one is even pursuing them. And you shall have no power to stand before your enemies and you will perish among the nations and in the land of your enemies shall eat you up. And those of you that are left shall waste away in the iniquity of your enemies' lands and also their fathers' iniquities which are with them, they shall waste away. So the sad and desperate plight if they turn away from God and abhor the covenant. But, the Lord said, if they will confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with the unfaithfulness in which they were unfaithful to me and that they also have walked contrary to me and that I also have walked contrary to them and have brought them into the land of their enemies, if their uncircumcised hearts are humbled and they accept their guilt, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob and Isaac and Abraham. And I will remember the land. And the land also shall be left empty by them and will enjoy its Sabbath while it lies desolate without them. And they will accept their guilt because they despised my judgments and because their soul abhorred my statutes. Yet, for all of that, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away, nor shall I abhor them to utterly destroy them and break my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. But for their sake I will remember the covenant of the ancestors whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations that I might be their God. I am the Lord. Even when they have been wasting away in captivity, God still holds out a hand of love if they will but confess their sins and turn to him. Now, if they confess their iniquity, the iniquity of their fathers, the unfaithfulness with which they were unfaithful to me. I want you to turn to Daniel, the ninth chapter. Daniel is with the children of Israel. They have been carried away to Babylon. They have been in Babylon for almost 70 years. And Daniel sets his face toward the Lord, verse 3, to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed, he said, to the Lord my God and made confession and said. And notice now this prayer of Daniel. In light of what God said, if you will confess your iniquity and the iniquity of your fathers and the unfaithfulness wherein you were unfaithful to me. Listen to Daniel's prayer. What a prince of a man. O Lord, great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and those who keep his, his commandments. We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers and all the people of the land. O oh Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us shame of face, as it is this day to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, those near and those afar off in the, all the countries to which you have driven them because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. O oh Lord, to us belongs the shame of face, to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. And to the Lord our God belongs mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. We've not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yes, all of Israel has transgressed your law. 
And, and notice how he's confessing. the. You know, so many times when God begins to judge us, we're prone to say, God, why did you do that? You know, as though we were so righteous. And God is at fault. As though God is smitten us harder than what we deserve. Here they are in this condition of captivity. Everything that God said would happen has happened. The land is desolate. The cities are wasted. They've been in captivity in their enemies' lands. And Daniel, as he prays, rather than blaming God or faulting God, which we are so often prone to do as God begins to deal with us in, in judgment. We're prone to fault God or blame God. And how many times I've heard people blaming God for the tragedies that befell their lives. Rather than Daniel say, Lord, to us belongs the shame of face. You're right in what you've done. We are guilty. We have sinned. We have turned our backs and acknowledging the sin and confessing the sin. And God declared, if you will do that, back here again in Leviticus, then I will remember the covenant that he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'll bring you back into the land. These are the statutes and judgments and laws which the Lord made between himself and the children of Israel on Mount Sinai by the hand of Moses. Now, as we get into chapter 27, we deal with things that were offered to God in a vow. Persons, properties, crops, animals, in those days it was a common thing for a person to make a vow to God. Which basically is, God, if you will do this for me, then this is what I'm going to give to you. This is what I'll do for you. You do this for me, I'll do this for you. Making a vow with God. In the book of Judges, we find a case of a vow being made by Jephthah, one of the judges, as he went out against the enemy. He said, God, if you will deliver the enemy into my hands. When I return in victory from war, the first thing that comes out of the door of my house, I will give to you as a burnt offering. And God gave him victory over the enemies, and as he returned home, Out of the door of his house came his young daughter with a tambourine singing and dancing of the victory that God had given to her father over the enemy. And he said, oh, you've made me extremely sad today because of the vow that I made to the Lord. And she said, well, Dad, if you made a vow, she's the only child, the only child Jephthah had. She said, if you've made a vow to the Lord, then you keep your vow. But give me at least a couple of months to go with my friends through the mountains that I might bewail my virginity. It means that there will be no offspring from Jephthah, no continuing generations, the only child. Now, it does not mean necessarily that he had to offer her as a sacrifice to the Lord. The Lord doesn't require that. And when we get to this portion here, you'll see 
what was required. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When a man consecrates by a vow certain persons to the Lord according to your valuation. If your valuation is of a male from 20 years old up to 60 years old, then the valuation shall be 50 shekels. So if you say, Lord, I want to give you my son. Well, I want to keep my son. So I have to value my son and the value will be 50 shekels. I have to give the Lord 50 shekels to keep my son. The value that you give to the Lord. Now, cheaper to offer your daughter. For if he offers a female between 20 and 60, then the valuation is only 30 shekels. If they are under five years old, the boy is only 20 shekels. And the girl would be only 10 shekels. And if you're over 60, or they go for, next of all to a month old and up to five years. From a month to five years is five shekels of silver for a boy and three for a girl. Over 60 years old, the male would be valued at 15 shekels and the female at 10 shekels. But if the fellow is too poor to even pay that, then he has to come to the priest and the priest determines what he can afford and the priest will set the value on it. The same is true if you say, Lord, if you'll do this, I'll give you this cow of mine, you know. And the Lord goes ahead and does that for you. Then, again, the, you want to redeem it. The priest will set the value and you have to add 20% to that valuation. Same thing if you say, Lord, I'll give you my house. If you'll just help me sell it, you know. And then the priest places the value on it and you have to pay 20% on top of that valuation. If you give to the Lord a portion of your field, then it's according to how much barley can be planted in that field. If you have an acre of ground and you can plant five bushels of barley, then... Uh, your field is valued at 50 shekels of silver. And, of course, they work in that year of jubilee when things are to be returned to their owner and all. Now, there are certain things that you could not offer to God because they belong to God in the first place. In other words, God would not accept a vow if you say, Lord, you know, I give you this firstborn lamb of mine. No, oh, no, he says, that already belongs to me. You can't do business with that. I'll give you my firstborn son. No, that already belongs to the Lord. The first already belonged to him. The same with tithes. People say, well, I'm going to give God my tithes. No, you don't give God your tithes. Those are his. If you use them, you're taking that which belongs to God. You don't give to God that which is already His. And so in verse 26, the firstling of the beast, which should be the Lord's firstling, no man shall sanctify whether it's an ox or sheep, because it is already the Lord's. But if it's an unclean beast, then you have to redeem it according to the valuation and adding a fifth part. And if it is not redeemed, then it shall be sold according to your valuation. Nevertheless, no devoted offering that a man may devote to the Lord of all that he has, both man and beast or the field his possession shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted offering is most holy to the Lord. Now no person under the ban who may become doomed to destruction among men shall be redeemed, but shall be surely put to death. In other words... If a man has committed a crime of which there is the capital punishment sentenced upon him, he's been sentenced, you can't buy him. He's got to be, that sentence has to be fulfilled. You cannot redeem him. You can't redeem his life. He's committed a crime and he has been sentenced to death. 
There's no redeeming of that man. He shall surely be put to death. All the tithe of the land, which is a tenth part, whether it's the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. And if you want to use any of it yourself, if you want to redeem your tithes, if you want to borrow from God, borrow your tithes, he charges 20%. He's as bad as the plastic cards. <laughs> right now it's cheaper to borrow from the bank. You can get it for 10% or so at the bank. God requires 20% of you borrow on your tithes. To redeem any of the tithes, you shall add 20% of it. It's tough. Concerning the tithe of the herd or the flock, whatever passes under the rod, the tenth one shall be holy to the Lord. Every tenth one belongs to God. You, you're counting, you, you, you hold out the rod and you let them pass under it. That's the way they count it. They stand there and they pass under it and as they go under they count them. It's every tenth one belongs to God. He shall not inquire whether it is good or bad. In other words, you say, oh, that's a good one. That next one's rotten. Like, it change it. You know. Uh-uh. God doesn't play those kind of games. You know, take it as it comes. Human nature. God knows human nature, and that's why he set these laws out. Like the farmer who came in and announced joyfully to his wife that the cow had just calved, and it had twins. And he said, this is just an extra blessing. So I'm going to give one of them to the Lord. We'll raise them and when we sell them, one belongs to the Lord and the other will be mine. God's special blessing. Just give it to the Lord. So as the little calves were growing up, the wife kept saying, well, honey, which one's the Lord? Which one's yours? He said, it doesn't matter. They're, you know, just one's the Lord's. One day he came in to get breakfast, and he was looking sort of down, and she said, what's wrong, honey? He said, oh, the Lord's calf just died. <laughs> God knows human nature. And when you're letting them pass under the rod, you're counting every tenth one goes to the Lord, and no switcheroos. Good for bad, bad for good. Not inquire whether it's good or bad, nor shall he exchange it. If he exchanges it, then they both belong to the Lord. <laughs> God's tough. You try and switch on him, he says, okay, they're both mine now. And you can't redeem them. These are the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses for the children of Israel on Mount Sinai. So we come to the end of the book of Leviticus, and next week get into Numbers. Now, in the book of Numbers, when we get to the Numbers... That is, you get to the, the numbering of the tribes and you get into those genealogies and, and those names and so forth. Jump it. Because it can just bog you down. So jump over uh, the, the numbering aspects uh, because you'll find that that'll be just really something that'll weigh you down heavy. But we'll take the first five chapters of the book of Numbers uh, next Sunday. Father, help us to learn from history. And to learn from your word that what you say you do and that you do keep your covenant and those blessings upon those who will obey and follow after you. But upon those that rebel. Lord, they also experience the work of God, but in a negative sense. God, help us not to be stubborn and obdurate, hard-hearted and hard-headed. But may we, O oh God, be pliable. May we be sensitive. May we be obedient. May we serve you, Lord, in obedience and in truth. 
And so help us, Father, to walk according to your will, to seek your ways, and to yield ourselves under the mighty hand of God that he might exalt us in due time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.